Mm-hmm. Welcome to Thrive and Advance podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sherry Afdahi, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Paul McManus. Paul had been a third generation CEO of a multi million dollar privately held company, and since 2015, he co founded and is the CEO of More Client, More Fun LLC, a lead generation and content marketing agency. Welcome to our show, Paul. Hey, Shari. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Tell us more about you. Um, yeah, so I, I ran my, my family's, um, it, was, it was an office products, office furniture company. Been around for 100 years. I was the third generation. I did it for 11 years. I was slated to take over. My, 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 my mom, who was also running it, at the point that she said she wanted to retire, I'm like, you know what, maybe this isn't the right industry for me. This was back in 2014 when, you know, up until that point, Staples and, you know, Office Depot and all these companies have been our primary competition. Whereas, you know, Amazon, I mean, you know, tr- try selling against Amazon. I mean, you know, these giant billion dollar companies are struggling with it. And imagine us, the small multi-billion dollar, you know, family owned company with about 12 employees trying to compete not only with these box stores, but now with this, you know, increasingly rising giant in that vertical market. Okay. So you decided to go where your passion was, marketing. I, so tell I, us about that. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because during those 11 years um, as CEO, you know, I, I wasn't trained in marketing um, and, you know, I was very passionate about growing the company, but it always felt like it was, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And so mm-hmm. um, kind of out of, necess- out of necessity, um, I started developing my expertise in marketing. Um, because that was the thing that I figured if I could figure this out, then, you know, all, all, the, all the problems go away, right? Um, yeah. And so I think it was 2013, maybe 2014, um, I discovered um, a, a book and then eventually a community called Book Yourself Solid. Um, and that's a best-selling book by um, a man named Michael Port. Um, and I ended up joining his community, becoming a certified coach for Book Yourself Solid. Um, and then shortly afterward, I founded my own company, which is More Clients, More Fun. Tell us what that means. More client, more fun. You know, <laughs> um, I, I think I'm pretty good at naming things. And, you know, one of the things I liked about Book Yourself Solid, both as the name of a book, as well as a community, as well as all these other things, is that the, 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 the benefit that people want is embedded in the name, right? And so you think, you know, for any person that's attracted to wanting to get more clients, in the case of Book Yourself Solid, it's like, that's what I want. That's exactly what I want. And so you kind of give this, you know, you kind of take this leap of faith that this is the solution for you. Um, and so I kind of caught on to that cleverness in the name. Um, and so as I was thinking about my names, it actually started as a tagline, but it was, okay, well, what do people want? The people that I'm serving and typically what they want is more clients. But part of my personality is that, you know, I don't like just to, you know, I, I mean, I can be serious, but I also like to have fun. And so, you know, if you're growing and doing good things, but you're not having fun in the process, to my mind, what's the point? And so I combine those two things, more clients, more fun, um, and it's stuck. Okay, that sounds good to me. More client, more fun. I love it. Okay, so uh, let's get into the meat of marketing. When we talk about um, marketing techniques, particularly if you're a smaller business, you're not a giant corporation, marketing is a sensitive area that does not have much budget, but certain techniques would help uh, be successful at it. What are those uh, techniques that you recommend, at least one or two things that you think would be really beneficial for uh, a business owner, a CEO or organization put in place? Sure. You know, um, I'll, let me put this in context from my standpoint, which is back when I ran the, the, the family company, you know, we probably spent $100,000 or so a year on marketing. So while that's not a big budget, you know, there's a decent sized budget. But at the same time, I never really thought that my dollars were being spent that well because it, I, I could never really track that spend X here and get Y here. So to me, the fascinating thing is that when I left that, I literally started my new company, More Clients, More Fun, with a $20 a month budget. <laughs> um, and so I had no money to spend. It, it was basically sink or swim. And you know, I started out with no money. And from day one, it's been generating money and paying for itself. Now, um, having done this for, I guess it's about five years now, and having coached 300 or so 
um, entrepreneurs and small business owners on exactly how to do this. Um, what I have discovered for myself um, and the tools that I use myself and the ones that I now increasingly specialize in helping clients with um, is a combination of LinkedIn and podcasting. Um, now, depending on who the audience is, you know, that may or may, may not be the best advice, but um, for the people that I serve, business owners, entrepreneurs, you know, that really are, you know, acting as the chief revenue um, officer, I find that a combination of LinkedIn and podcasting is so effective for a variety of reasons that we can get into. Right. So tell us about LinkedIn. So what do you recommend people do to truly benefit from a, this giant opportunity uh, to market the business, to market themselves on LinkedIn? Sure. You know, it, 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 it varies depending on industry. So, you know, interestingly enough, you know, d depending on who you are and who you're trying to find it, the approach can be different. So, um, for example, I, w I work with a number of um, uh, financial advisors who run, you know, independent financial advisors who run their own practice. Um, and for the ones that are targeting what I would call mid-market prospects, um, in other words, people that maybe earn $100,000 or more of revenue, um, possibly a small business owner, um, you know, doing what I would describe as cold lead generation is very effective. And this is essentially, it's not what people think of today as social selling. I mean, it's literally going out and driving appointments, um, sales appointments, not networking, but with your ideal target clients, um, the demographics are right, and the first call is a sales call. Um, and if, if your market, if your target market meets certain standards, then LinkedIn as a purely lead generation platform can be extremely effective. Now, there's another group, and I think that, you know, this, this may or may not be your case or, you know, people that are um, similar to you, is that if you're going after, you know, CEOs or um, executives or business owners that are either A, not as active on LinkedIn, or B, are increasingly... Um, I'll use the word, you know, difficult to reach, you know, different words to describe it, potentially higher status, meaning that they're not spending all of their time on LinkedIn, um, then it requires a different approach. Um, the numbers game doesn't work as well there, um, and it really requires to lead with relationship. Um, and this is where podcasting becomes the most beautiful strategy there is to really build relationships first with those otherwise, you know, very high caliber um, individuals that you're looking to meet either as a prospect, as a strategic partner, referral partner, a, a, a whole host of things. So what is the reason that podcasting is um, such a treasure these days in trying to reach and build relationships? Is there, we know that millennials, uh, that are pretty much anyone 40 years and younger to mid 20s um, are the the sort of the actual key in um, workforce. So mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit from your perspective when you talk about podcasting, of course, or podcasting. Sure. Uh, why is podcasting is so beneficial? The I, I have a long list, so let, let's start with the ones that I think are probably most important, but it really serves any number of business development needs. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that I love talking about and sharing is one that people don't necessarily think about, um, but to me, podcasting is the new authority symbol. So, you know, you've, you've published a book, maybe multiple books, Shore. And so, you know, the word authority, the word author is built into the word authority. Um, and while, you know, people, you know, being an author still has its place, what's interesting is that if you watch, you know, you know, the news programs or different things, increasingly what you see people identifying themselves as is, is, is less so author of XYZ book, although that still has its place, but increasingly it's host of XYZ show. Mm -hmm. This has become the new authorship. And it's, inc it's, it's incredibly democratic, meaning that, you know, you're not reliant upon some big publisher to, um, you know, grant you permission to, you know, join the club. Um, it's different from, I would say, self-publishing, in which case, you know, oftentimes people, and I know a lot of people like this, that, you know, pour their heart and soul into a book, only self-publish it, you know, and there's a moment of pride there, but only to have it, you know, not sell. Mm -hmm. um, 
podcasting by comparison is it, it, it's purely visible, right? I mean, you know, you're, you're doing so many things at the same time. One, if you choose your guests well, you're building a relationship with, you know, potential customer, a strategic partner, a referral source. And so even if nobody ever watched it, although we do want people to watch it, um, you know, from day one, you're building that relationship. So instead of having a 30 minute sales call or, you know, get networking call, you're immediately creating that bond. Um, the other part of it, I'm going to pivot a little bit here, but, you know, in terms of effectiveness of marketing, um, you know, if you, you know, it, today's world is increasingly noisy. Um, I mean, it's been noisy for a long time, but it's increasingly noisy, meaning that there's, there's no, you know, to, to cut through the clutter, to cut through the noise. I mean, you know, there's, you know, our brains are, you know, don't have the capacity to find new information. And so increasingly, if you go out and have somewhat of a generic sales pitch, although it might be effective, it might, you know, hit the right nerve, it might say the right things, you know, it's like, well, you know, who are you and does that really matter? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's different levels here that I'm going to briefly break down. So, you know, there's the generalist, there's the specialist that starts getting more specific in terms of who they serve. But even there, there's so many other people doing it. You know, I mean, if you go on LinkedIn, you'll see how many people help coaches get X, Y, and Z. I mean, you know, how, try differentiating yourself there. So then if you think about, okay, how do I really stand out? There's the next level, which is um, how can I not just be an authority, you know, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us, especially have, you know, a PhD, you know, you know that you're an authority because you've, you've done certain things, but how can you be seen as an authority in this field? And then the next level even higher is how can you increasingly celebritize what you do? And let me give you a couple examples. So if you're an authority in your market, that means that people recognize you as the expert. You know, this is the person to go to if you're trying to solve X, Y, and Z. They've heard about you. But what we want to go is a step higher, whereas not only have they heard about us, but increasingly they see you associated with all of the top known leaders in a specific industry. You know, I like to use the the the, the example of um I have a couple or I have one client that works with aerospace and defense professionals, and I'm talking to her about starting her podcast. And I'm like, you know, if you're there hanging out with Elon Musk you know, on a podcast, I mean, what does that do to your marketing that instantly celebritizes you? I mean, it creates a completely different dynamic so that you literally go from being a salesperson, quote unquote, to becoming what I call a center of influence. And that changes everything. Right. I totally agree with you. From a sales perspective, when I talk about um, how sales relationships can be successful. I always talk about that step of reciprocity. If you give good information, valuable information that, that helps your um, target market, which is a terrible way to identify market, but that's how the marketing target market. Sure. Um, but it, you're giving so much information, it attracts um, your uh, potential clients, customers, or whomever you deal with to, to come to you. You know, when you give, people feel they give back. Sure. So, I agree. Sure. Excellent. Definitely. So, you know, uh, we all um, do marketing in our business, right? And uh, particularly when you are just getting going, whether you've got a few employees or maybe, you know, 20 or so, uh, marketing, we try to throw spaghetti to the wall to see what mm -hmm. sticks. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we waste a lot of time and energy and money, right? Sure. So can you talk about some of the mistakes that you see normally people make that are frustrated? They've kind of exhausted resources, financial resources, or even um, as, as a person, their, their own resources sure. and that you deal with, that you help your clients stay away from. Sure. Um, you know, I love the question. Um, one is just checking boxes, right? And so there's so much buzz around social media today. Um, and so, you know, probably if anyone goes to an industry conference or, you know, people like, are you on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, all these different things. And I think what happens is that oftentimes the owner or the decision maker, you know, doesn't necessarily, you know, doesn't necessarily have the expertise in it, but they have a marketing assistant or someone who's hired to make posts as an example. 
Um, and so the person posts different things on, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. And it doesn't really attract any revenue. It doesn't really drive the business. And so I think there's a lot of frustration that can be there. Well, you know, I'm hearing social, you know, social media is a place to be, yet I don't see any correlation between what I'm spending on people, resources, and what I'm getting as a result. Um, and I see that as a big sticking point. And so um, one of the things that I, you know, help business owners and companies with is really craft the strategy that isn't checking boxes, but really driving results. Um, and one of the first metrics that we use for, for our clients who typically are interested in, in sales calls is, you know, on a weekly, monthly basis, you know, how many call, sales calls are you having? Um, you know, that's a very, you know, good measurement of the effectiveness of your social media strategy. Um, so I guess to go back to the question is that, you know, if you're frustrated by something seemingly not working, it's not that that social media, as an example, doesn't work. It's probably it's not being done in a way that really serves your business. And so, um, you know, probably one of the best investments you can make, in addition to listening to podcasts like this, is to, you know, talk to and surround yourself by people that are getting results using these strategies um, versus just thinking that you're checking the box on social media. Right. So it's really important for people to recognize the content you post needs to be appropriate. So uh, the machinery is the post on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and all, but the content, is it uh, consistent to what you want to see happen, to building those relationships and attracting the people that you're looking to talk to? Totally. Um, and and not only is it that, but in addition, are enough people, enough of the right people viewing it, right? So if we're simply posting content and let's say we've, we've done our due diligence, we've created content that's attractive to our target, our target audience, you know, look at the metrics. I mean, you know, everything that you do needs to be analyzed. You know, it needs to be taken from the framework. Okay, it's good content. You know, is it bringing in results? Okay, if not, why not? And oftentimes it might be, well, you know, there's 10 people are seeing the post, right? <laughs> and they may or may not be the right people. And so the question could be, how do we, you know, increase the number of people? If we've invested in the right content, now it's how can we increase the number of people that are in the target audience that we want to put this content in from? And of course, from there, there's multiple strategies that can be used for that, but it's always looking at the numbers and, and, and analyzing what's working, why it's working, and then what's not working and why isn't it working. And so um, as the business owner or CEO, you know, you may not be the expert in all of the, the, the technology we'll say, but it is incumbent upon you to make sure that whether it's yourself or the person that this is delegated to, you know, does know what the numbers are, why it's working, why it's not working and how to, and how to potentially fix that. Right. So tracking, right? You have to track, track exactly. to sure. measure. And even uh, marketing is sometimes it's not, that tangible there are ways to track and measure you just have to have the person that knows what to track and how to track it well you know i'll, I'll challenge it a little bit in today's world everything is 100 percent trackable you know by and large i mean you know gone are the days you know for mo for many of us when you know I, I come from a you know small you know business like i said in the beginning which you know back in the day we used to put an ad in the newspaper mm -hmm. now you know how do you track that you know it's like well we got some brand awareness hopefully you know but we didn't necessarily have the system just to differentiate etc but with digital media i mean increasingly there's not an excuse okay. to not know exact to know your numbers um everything is so inherently trackable if you if you make that a priority with digital media so let's talk about that. Let's talk about digital media. You, um, you work with certain systems and you advise your clients to employ certain systems to be able to truly advantage, take, into, take advantage of uh, digital media or digitization altogether, right? And uh, learn how to do data mining and be able to analyze it and really understand is it working or is it not? So what are those systems you recommend for people, for business owners and leaders to employ in their business? Um, 
so so that there can be a variety of things. Um, let me just talk about a couple of things that we use. Um, so for example, um, you know, one of our specialties is LinkedIn. Um, and so we have software that interacts with LinkedIn um, that automates any number of the tasks. And whether this is for a business owner or whether this is for a salesperson at a company, you know, your job, your highest value is not in prospecting per se. It's in having, it's having converse, it's, it's, it's in engaging in sales conversations as a result of the people that have responded to your marketing. Um, and so the first thing is to, you know, have, you know, is to look at different automation. Okay. You know, any tasks that we're doing, how can we automate this to, re, you know, cause that's a lot of that can be fairly low level work and a lot of it increasingly you can automate. Um, you know, the, the second thing, um, which comes to mind for me is, and I think we all get in this trap myself included is that, you know, I run a company that does, you know, done for you podcasting. And while we have the systems in place for our clients, um, until recently, I was actually letting my own podcast kind of, you know, gather a little bit of dust and, you know, it's like, well, I'm busy and I don't have time, et cetera. And so I realized that that, you know, is, is, is not smart thinking. Um, and so I essentially delegated my podcast to my team who manages it much better than I do. Um, and so, you know, I guess the fundamental it's, you know, on the one side, there's automation that is, is, is possible in, in many ways, but the other side is having a team around you you know, we can get into teams in a long discussion, but just a couple things that come to mind is, you know, you know, just the principle of tracking your time and deciding, is this something that you should be doing or someone else should be doing? Um, sure. I know that you actually, um, as my business coach at one point, you um, had me track my time, which was very interesting. Um, I've currently, I've, I, I got this little tool here. It's called Timeular but it tracks your time and you simply put this on your desk with the side up that you want to track and it'll automatically track your time. So I can say, okay, how much time am I spending in business development? And I actually have one side that says, you know, stuff that other people should be doing for me. <laughs> how much time am I spending on tasks that is stuff that other people should be doing for me? Um, and so, you know, tracking your time, you know, determining if this is the best use of your time, you know, do you have a resource to delegate this to? And if not, how can you develop that resource? Increasingly in today's world, you know, I like to think about location free. And so, you know, I have um, employees, contractors that, you know, I have, I have nobody in my office. I'm in my home office right now, as you can see. Um, but all of the people that work for me are with me. They're in a different city, a different state, possibly a different country. And it really doesn't matter. And so there, there's, you know, other than deciding that you want to use your time for what's best use of your time and developing a team of people that are experts in what they do. Um, there's really no excuse in today's world. Right. So going with this, uh, it's, let me tap into your leadership experience, sure. You've been a leader. So um, time management comes to mind being an issue and you referenced it. And it's very true to identify um, what are the things you have to delegate, especially as the organization is growing? When your organization is growing, learning to go from technician to the visionary, because that's what you have to be and what you need to delegate. So that's really important. But staying with the leadership piece, what is the one skill that you believe leader, the leaders must um, really perfect or re at least improve to be effective in uh, marketing for their organization. So I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, and this may apply to some people, but not to others. You know, so I, my area of expertise is marketing. And so it's a good use of my time to learn new strategies, especially nowadays as things are constantly changing so that I'm continually, um, you know, looking at metrics, improving what's, improving what's working and getting rid of what's not working. Um, and like anyone else, you know, I find myself increasingly in the weeds of things. And so I need to be always vigilant about when I'm learning something new, it's good that I'm doing it. It's good that I'm hands-on. It's good that I'm testing. It's good that I'm playing with it. It's good that I'm maybe, you know, using it a few times, but there comes a point that, okay, this is something that we want to use in our company, but now I need to delegate this out. This is no longer, even though I might enjoy it, it's no longer 
a good use of my time. And so, you know, making sure that, so, so the skill I think um, is maybe self-awareness, but it's also the ability to delegate. Um, and, you know, delegation, the ability to delegate and hold people, you know, one is to get it off of your plate, so to speak, but then secondly, it's to make sure that you have the right people that are then performing at a level that makes, you know, that satisfies what you're trying to accomplish. Thank you. So now um, uh, you mentioned strategy. So let's go with strategy now. Okay. Um, in marketing, of course, there are tactics, mm -hmm. uh, but tactics must have a strategy behind them to make it work, sure. right? Sure. So what is a strategy, integrated strategy in marketing that would help the ingredients of it, right? Sure. It's a recipe, the ingredients, the pieces, the tactics you're using, um, successful. Sure. Um, I'm going to come back to podcasting here. Um, podcasting to me, if done right, is so effective for so many reasons. And I'll give you myself as an example. So, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, believe and oftentimes rightly so that referrals are probably the best business you can have. And the reason for that is that, you know, someone has a need, there's a transfer of a trust, um, and now it's your job to step up and, you know, capitalize on the opportunity. Um, I was recently looking at our own um, internal new clients and seeing what the source was, where did, where did they come from? And 80% of them over the past three months were not referrals. They came as pure cold leads, you know, people that we prospected on LinkedIn, but you actually, you know, you know, in our systems, you can track, you know, the kind of the journey, if you will, um, what led from the initial touch to that first call with me as a sales call. And invariably they go through my podcast. We reach out to them proactively we suggest different podcast links from to our to our show that we think you know might whet their appetite. They watch that. There's an optional masterclass that they can go through, but then they reach out. And what is so critical about this is that it completely changes the game in terms of that conversation that you're having. When I book my first call with someone, even though they probably never knew me or heard of me two weeks before they immediately are seeing me as a center of influence. My, my quote unquote status is up here and you can tell in the call, the language, their information coming into it. So I can really control to my advantage that whole sales process from that point on. Um, but what allows for that is the reputation, the public reputation that I've very intentionally choreographed and crafted and it's best captured through my podcasts. Excellent. So you would say you would have a roadmap for how you engage on LinkedIn, the first interaction, um, and how you uh, curate that inner that relationship by uh, sending consistent, um, informative messages, which leads to a conversation. It, it leads to the conversation, but more importantly, it leads to a conversation on terms that are favorable to me. Right. And uh, which, so consistent, go ahead. Which, which then leads for, you know, my, my preference is to have fewer sales calls, but higher conversions. Um, and so I, I, I for, my, for my business, you know, people go through a couple of different steps before they can speak to me. Once they do, you know, my conversions are 80%. And this is with cold, quote unquote, cold leads. People that hadn't heard of me, you know, two weeks before making a sizable investment into the services but the whole thing is choreographed. It's, it's all by design. And so would you say consistency becomes a key measure, right? Um, it, it, it can be. Um, and, 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 I, and I pause. And, and so generally I would say yes. And I pause just because we've had to turn off our systems because we're building out <laughs> our team more. And so we're like, no more. <laughs> right. um, and so, so as a general principle, yes. Um, I, I think another principle, though, is is what is that reputation that you're creating by design that people check out before they ever get on the call with you? Right, right. Well, it's a good thing you have to shut off the pipe 
because just with <laughs> water coming out, that's a good case scenario. Well, it, it's a good thing, but also, so it's a good, definitely it's a good thing. It's also, because it's all by design, it's also something where it's like the faucet, okay, you know, we have the ability to turn it off a little bit, slow it down, or to, you know, drive it back up. And so right now, internally, what we're doing is we're, we're continuing to build out our systems, our team, et cetera, so that we have the resources to um, continue to take on more and more people without driving up my stress level. <laughs> Very true. Now, tell us about one thing. I'm sure there's many, but, um, or there are many. Uh, what, what is the one uh, lesson you learned from a mentor that has been key in your success as an entrepreneur? You know, what, what comes to mind first is, and this I'll credit to, um, um, I guess, a colleague friend of mine, his name is Josh Patrick, but um, f fail fast, fail cheap. Um, and so, you know, especially in today's online world where you can do so many different things that, and it doesn't really necessarily require a large investment, one of the biggest factors is to take action. Um, and I think a lot of people don't take action because of, you know, probably personal limiting beliefs or, you know, what have you. Um, and so the lesson that I've learned that's really helped me go from that $20 a month budget to now spending ridiculous amounts of money on technology um, is just taking action, you know, being, w being willing to fail. Um, and if I fail at, so at something, you know, I want to learn my lesson and either fix it or move past it. Um, as quickly as possible. Anything else you'd like to tell our audience that we didn't talk about? Um, you know, I just want to brag on Shoray for a little bit. She, um, you know, I, I jokingly, um, talk to, you know, she and I have a really good relationship. Um, she's been to a couple of retreats that we've put out, and I like to think of her as a lovable PhD. And so I think that that's very important for your audience to know, is that she's not only smart, she's also lovable. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some words of wisdom about leadership as well as marketing. So hopefully we'll have you um, on the show again another time to talk about some other specific things. Cool. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good day.